Looking at the title of this video, you may jump to the conclusion that this was just another atrocity committed by colonial powers against a local population, but you'd be wrong. This genocide was in fact committed by the Maori against the Moriori, who lived on an island over 500 miles away from New Zealand. The Moriori were in fact largely pacifist and they were massacred in some pretty barbaric ways, while many of them were enslaved by the invaders. For those enslaved, they were forbidden from marrying and even speaking their own language. So although there were not many Moriori, just a couple thousand in total, the numbers may not shock you compared to the Holocaust or Cambodian Genocide. But the last Moriori died in the 1930s, meaning the entire population has now been wiped from the face of the earth. But first, I just want to say thank you to Lightning Link Casino for sponsoring this video, and if you want to support my channel by installing the game, click on the link in the description. Now this game allows you to enjoy all the fun of a casino for free, therefore it does not allow gambling or the option to win real money, but you can still enjoy all the classic slot games. As this is a history channel and I'm a little bit of a history buff, obviously I'll be drawn more towards slots like Silk Road, but really, I'm having way more luck on King of the Nile. Here, I just seem to win on nearly every spin. Plus, it's Lightning Link's third birthday, and right now, to celebrate, they're running two weeks of exciting events, offers, and in-game gifts. They're also celebrating with new slot machines like Dragon Link and Buffalo Gold. So enjoy all the fun of free casino games online with Lightning Link Casino. And you know they're good because these are the same people that brought many classic games like Fa 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 Gold and The Heart of Vegas. So spin authentic free casino games with the greatest collection of free slot machines. Now this game is only for players who are 18 and above, but for those of you who are, follow the link in the description and enjoy all of these new slots. The first European to arrive in New Zealand was Abel Tasman, a Dutch explorer who arrived there in the 17th century. But for over 100 years or so, nobody really returned, and it wasn't really until the late 18th and early 19th century that Europeans began to trade regularly with the Maori and establish settlements. However, it should be said that the Maori, the locals to New Zealand, didn't really arrive in New Zealand that long before the Europeans. It's widely believed that these Austronesian settlers only arrived there in the 13th century, so around the same time that the Mongols were tearing their way across Eurasia. Then the Moriori arrived in the Chatham Islands around 1500, so after the discovery of the Americas. Anyway, when the European and Americans began to arrive in large numbers to trade with the Maori, this began the Musket Wars, which completely changed the culture of warfare in New Zealand. Before this, the Maori lived in their rohi, or tribal territories, and largely they all kept one another in check. But when some began to acquire western weapons, they launched devastating attacks against old enemies. For instance, one of the first to do so was Hongi Hika, who was a chief in the far north. Beginning in 1818, he raided nearby groups which still used traditional weapons and enslaved hordes of people. These slaves he then put to work making flax, which he'd sell to the Europeans, and this would allow him to buy yet more muskets. Some Westerners joined Hongi Hika on his raids, like the Australian Jackie Marmon, and men like him would be instrumental in bringing more arms to New Zealand. Another notable chief during these wars was T. Rauparaha. He ruled over the Ngati Toa people in the southern part of the North Island, but would later go on to conquer the likes of Kapiti Island. However, at the beginning of these wars, he was less successful and was chased out of his homeland by invaders and it was during his escape while hiding in a pit, he wrote probably the most famous hacker, Kamate Kamate. This celebrates escaping death, as Kamate Kamate Keora Keora just means tis life, tis death. The next part of the lyrics talks about how he met a hairy man, a friendly chief, who helped him afterwards. And it was this song that the New Zealand rugby players used to sing before matches. These raids and attacks, besides the enslavement, were also somewhat notable for their brutality. In Maori culture, there was a custom known as Utu, which essentially meant that all attacks needed to be avenged, so it was almost never ending for a few decades. Plus, during these wars, many people began to sell the smoked heads of enemy warriors. This environment of bloody raids was fueled by muskets, revenge, and also, strangely, potatoes. Potatoes had been recently introduced to New Zealand, but they allowed raiders to travel further distances. Also, the fields could be tilled by women, allowing men to leave for months at a time. Plus, growing potatoes along with flax also became a job for slaves, and therefore the need for slaves increased. Then, in the middle of these musket wars, the genocide took place. 
However, while there was so much bloodshed over in New Zealand, over in the Chatham Islands, the Moriori had followed a philosophy of non-violence ever since the 16th century. This was after Nanuku Wenea, a tribal chief, despaired over intertribal violence, and their culture had banned wars. So they were completely unprepared for the veteran Maori soldiers that were about to land on their shores. In 1835, a group of Maori from the Ungati Mutunga and Ungati Tama tribes hijacked a ship known as the Lord Rodney. In the words of its captain named Harewood, he tried to buy whalebone from them, but the natives would not part with the bone unless I would consent to take them to Chatham Island. There appeared to be a muster of about 300 natives at this place. Having been unsuccessful in my trip, the chief on board said he would compensate me for my loss of time by a present of some hogs. He sent a number of canoes away and they returned filled with hogs etc as a present. There was also a quantity of hogs and potatoes on shore which the chief requested me to look at. For this purpose I left the brig, taking with me a good boat's crew. A short time after landing I discovered that some natives had taken the boat from my men. Mr Davis, one of my passengers, informed me that they had rushed upon the crew and tied their hands behind them, saying they did not want to hurt anyone on board or plunder the ship but would have the vessel to convey them to Chatham Island, as a tribe of natives had declared war against those of Port Nicholson, and would massacre the whole of them if they remained. So Harewood agreed to sail them to avoid bloodshed, but constantly tried to plot to take back his ship. The Maori then filled the boat with supplies, but very little water. So Harewood continues, the natives were seasick, and on the 17th, the women that had young children were calling out violently for water. When I ordered them to be supplied, the strongest of the men however only got water, leaving the women and children without. At 1.30pm, saw Chatham Island, when the natives gave a terrible shout, and women cried for joy, as this is the custom in New Zealand. The New Zealanders had killed several dogs and hung them in different directions, for this purpose, as they said, of driving the ship back to them. The savages also killed a young girl of about 12 years of age, cut her to pieces, and hung her flesh up to posts in the same manner as the dogs, saying that she was the cause of our detention. So the first victim of the genocide was a 12 year old girl, whose body was dismembered and skin hung up for all to see. The Moriori nevertheless agreed to nurse the injured Maori back to health and generally welcomed them into their villages. But the hundreds of Maori who arrived then began to attack the locals, some they actually killed in some pretty horrible ways. As Edward Trieger wrote, when the Maori overcame the gentle Moriori's of Chatham Island, not only did they keep the captives penned up like livestock waiting to be killed and eaten, but one of the leading chiefs of the invaders ordered a meal of six children at once to be cooked to regale his friends. I was shown a part of the beach on Chatham Island on which the bodies of 80 Moriori women were laid side by side, each with an impaling stake driven into the abdomen. So the Maori took hundreds of women and children and impaled them on the beach but impaled them in such a way that they survived for days, until eventually dying in absolute agony. Plus, Maori cannibalism needs to be touched upon, as it would have been the fate of many of the Moriori. There's been numerous instances of Maori cannibalism, but as Trieger continues writing, sometimes the heart of the vanquished was roasted for ceremonial purposes. The heart of a chief of the defending party was cut out and roasted in a fire, while the attacking warriors stretched out their arms towards the heart while it was cooking. When the priests ended their chant, the warriors took up the song, while the chief priest tore off a portion of the heart and threw it among the enemy to weaken them. The heart of a victim of sacrifice was not only eaten for war purposes, sometimes it was for other reasons. Thus, Uanuku ate the heart of his wife who had committed adultery, the heart of a human sacrifice was eaten at a house building ceremony, and also at the tattooing of the lips of a chief's daughter, and at the felling of a tree to be used for a great chief's canoe. But this was all pretty customary at the time. For instance, Hongi, who I mentioned before, returned from his raid on the southern tribes. He brought back 2,000 prisoners to the Bay of Islands. One of the latest cannibal feasts of consequence was held near Wellington, when 150 of the Mao Poco tribe went into the ovens. So, like other defeated people, many Moriori were cannibalized, and in the initial attacks, 10% of the population was killed while the rest were enslaved. Meanwhile, the Maori also urinated on or destroyed many of the sacred sites. But the Moriori, who outnumbered the attackers by over 2 to 1, still refused to break from Nanuku's law. So they remained pacifists, and this was essentially just a slaughter in many instances. Moriori survivors talked about how they fled into the forest and the mountains, but they were eventually all found and either killed or enslaved. 
Those enslaved were forbidden from living with their children or spouses, and they couldn't even speak their own language. So, within a few decades, their population was essentially wiped from the face of the map. Now, it could be argued that the Maori had learned from the Europeans and their ways, but this wouldn't exactly be true. For instance, Della Cotta, who was a descendant of the survivors, said, If only we had the Treaty of Waitangi, if only we had been colonised by the British. This is in reference to the treaty signed between the British and the Maori, which gave the Maori ownership of their lands, forests and other possessions, and also gave them the right to be British subjects. So they're saying here that they'd at least maintained some rights under British rule, rather than being essentially wiped out. Of course, there were other atrocities committed by the British in New Zealand against the Maori, but the enslavement of the Moriori continued until 1863 long after it had been abolished in the British Empire. Plus, by the time they were released from their enslavement, there were only around a hundred or so of them left. And today there are no more unmixed Moriori left, as the last one, Tommy Solomon, died in 1933. Now there are many descendants of the survivors of this genocide, but they largely come from mixed ancestry now. So this is just one of the great number of forgotten genocides that took place throughout history, which should really be given a little more attention. Like the Selknam genocide over in southern Chile, which wiped out over 80% of the indigenous population in the late 19th century. Or, more recently, in 2002 during the Congo Wars, people targeted the Mbuti Pygmies, who are most famous for being particularly short with an average height of around 4 foot 11. But 60,000 of them were killed, which was roughly half of their overall population. There's also the Jungar genocide in 18th century China, which could have been the world's first genocide. Or, over in Somalia in the 1980s, there was the Isaac Genocide. But which genocide do you believe needs more attention? Leave them in the comments below.